Hey guys, Christy here. So we have some new readers who are going to be reading Dreamwall Quarantine and the last four books. And we want to just introduce you to the new readers for the rest of the book series. Hi, I'm Allison. I've been a fan since the beginning of when this season, when Roswell first aired. Um, and my favorite character is Michael. <laughs> and um, yeah, we're going to be reading um, Dreamwalk. Hi, I'm Tisha. Um, I'm 31. My favorite ship is um, Max and Liz. Uh, I've been a diehard Roswell fan from the beginning, so looking forward to these book reads. Chapter 9. Isabel stood alone in the desert. She didn't recognize the location, but that was not odd, since the miles and miles of dirt surrounding Roswell had a tendency to look the same. Immediately, she wondered if this patch of wasteland was a reflection of a real place from Kyle's past, or if it was entirely imagined. Then she naturally questioned what it could possibly mean. Could be loneliness, she thought, or death. Possibly emptiness, or loss, or a hundred other things. Maybe just wait to consult the dream analysis book when I wake up. Looking over the flat, barren land, she could see for miles, and it was obvious that she was entirely alone. This was strange because being Kyle's dream, she had expected to see him as soon as she had popped into it. Usually when she dream walked, the dreamer was the first person she would see. At the very least, she expected him to arrive shortly after she did. Being alone in the middle of the desert with nowhere to go, all she could do was wait. Kyle, she called out after some time had passed, but received no answer. What is going on? A screech from above directed her attention to the sky. Looking up, Isabel saw what appeared to be a vulture circling ahead or it could have been a buzzard she was never really sure what the difference was between the two one single solitary bird of prey was waiting just like she just like she was another screech came from the sea and let me have a sound well <laughs> that was both strange and familiar to isabel she did not make the noise of a bird but somehow it sounded slightly like the high-pitched cry of a woman uncomfortable standing beneath the circling predator isabel started walking in the direction she was facing for lack of any better plan. From her past, limited studies of dreams, she tried again to remember if she had ever read anything that related to what she was seeing, but she was certainly no expert in the field. Instead, she took mental pictures of everything around her so she could look it up in her dream book in the morning. If she didn't find anything there, she was sure there were hundred more books on the subject. Maybe Jesse won't mind part of our day together being spent in the library. Even though it was only a dream, Isabel could feel the desert heat beginning to rise, but she never felt uncomfortable. No matter how much the heat increased, her skin did not feel like it was burning. She never even broke a sweat. Out of habit, more than anything, she took shelter in the shade of a rock formation. As soon as the sun was blocked and the cool darkness enveloped her, she found herself transported to the Roswell police station. The place was bustling with deputies moving in every direction. It was far busier than she had ever remembered seeing it before, largely with faces of people she didn't recognize, although one or two seemed vaguely familiar. She, she doubted there was a time in Roswell history that that many police had been on the force at the same time. It was just too crowded for their little town. Turning a corner, she nearly ran right into Deputy Blackwood. She immediately recognized the Native American who had unintentionally led her and her friends to the Mesalika Reservation two years ago where they had ultimately found the first real clues to their past. Since he was the first familiar image she had seen, Isabel followed the deputy, hoping he would lead her to Kyle. Deputy Blackwood, she called after him. Wait right here, he replied, without looking at her. Isabel wondered if he had actually been speaking to her, since he hardly noticed that she was there. He was busy talking with another deputy behind the front desk. He seemed to be ignoring her entirely. While she watched the two police officers carrying out their conversation, Isabel noticed that Deputy Blackwood looked considerably younger than he did the last time she had seen him. She wondered if that was some kind of clue or if it was just Kyle remembered the man differently in his dream. Remember, these are just images, she thought. Don't expect it all to be true to life. Soon, Isabel grew tired of waiting. Deputy Blackwood, he continued his conversations if she wasn't there. Deputy Blackwood, she tried again, but still received no answer. She wondered if he even saw her there in the first place. Great. Feeling the need to move on, Isabel continued her search for Kyle in the lobby of the police station. Unable to find her friend, she decided to broaden her search area. Being where she was, she naturally looked for a dream image of Sheriff Valenti as well, but she could not find him either. 
Making her way through the station, she did her best to stay out of the way of the many, many officers tending to their affairs. It did not seem to Isabel they were in any rush or in any emergency. They all seemed to be going on about their daily business. In Kyle's dream, the police station was much larger than it was in real life, with winding and twisting halls that simply did not exist. She knew this for a fact, since she was at the Roswell police station far more times than any girl her age should have been. Making her way to where she felt was the most logical place to go, Isabel walked a circuitous route to the sheriff's office. Once she finally reached the office, she found the door closed. As she placed her hand upon the knob, she could hear from within the sounds of a man sobbing. Carefully turning the knob, Isabel pushed the door open and walked right into the Valenti living room. The crying had stopped. The room was empty. Back in the place she had left a short time ago, in reality, she found the house looked pretty much the same as when she had been there. There were real, some notable differences, however. For one, daylight now shone through the windows, making the place much brighter than it had been. Naturally, Kyle was no longer on the couch where she had left him, although it was made up to look like a bed. Then she remembered that for the last several months of the school year, the couch had been Kyle's bed. His actual room had been taken over by someone else. A feeling of trepidation came over her as she realized this part of the dream was taking place in the not so distant past. Again, Isabel checked around for Kyle, but he wasn't in the room. This is a really, really, really odd, she thought. Where's Kyle? Voices are coming from Kyle's bedroom. The voices were familiar. They sounded very angry. Isabel knew exactly what was going on behind the closed door to Kyle's room, but she did not want to see it. At the same time, however, she was drawn to the room. Whether it was because of the dream walk or her own curiosity, Isabel could not be sure. But suddenly the door was open and she was standing at the threshold about to witness an event that she had her own nightmares about. It was Alex, her Alex, the Alex she had tried to ignore for so long until it was too late. He was in pain talking about Las Cruces and mind warps. He could barely stand. His face was twisted in what Isabel could only imagine to be excruciating pain. Tess was there too. Alex was leaning on her, holding to her, onto her as if he did not have the power to stand on his own. She looked frightened and trapped. There wasn't a trace of the anger Isabel had expected to see, only fear. It had been so much easier to think that Tess had acted out of anger. It made hating her all the more effortless. Tess turned, looking directly at Isabel. Kyle, get out, she yelled, with anger finally creeping into her voice as if Kyle had done something wrong simply by walking into his own bedroom. But Kyle wasn't standing there. Isabel was. It was the first time she had seen Tess and she found out the truth behind Alex's death. The chance to make her either explain why or suffer for what she had done. And even though Isabel knew that the image standing before her was only a dream, she still wanted to lash out, to hurt her, and to kill her. Through her own boiling anger, Isabel heard Alex say that he might as well be dead. No, Isabel yelled as, as if the strength of her voice could stop past events. Don't say that, don't, don't wish that, she screamed, trying to tear him away from Tess, but something held her firmly in her spot. She could not move, she could not stop what was happening. She could only watch as Tess grabbed Alex's hands and closed her eyes, performing the mind warp, the last mind warp, the fatal. No, screamed in unison with Alex. Still locked in place, Isabel watched Alex crying out in pain, trying to pull away, then falling to the floor to his death. Isabel broke loose a torrent of sobs. Not even her most horrific dream had prepared her for witnessing the events as they had played out. She had never even imagined the feeling of helplessness Kyle must have experienced watching the scenario unfold and not knowing what was going on, ultimately realizing there was nothing he could have done. An intense feeling of, of guilt washed over her worse than she had ever felt before. A moment later, Isabel was dr dragging a duffel bag. She was confused. What was going on? Where's Alex? Did it really happen? Did I really see what I, what I saw? The bag was heavy and the weight was unevenly distributed. It didn't feel right to her. Tess followed as Isabel dragged the bag out of the Valenti house. There was a forced smile on Tess's face. Isabel knew that she should hate the girl, but she couldn't figure out why. She carelessly deposited the bag into the car, stuffing it into the front seat. Suddenly, realization struck Isabel. It hit with the force of a train. There was no duffel bag. Alex was the thing that she had loaded into the car. 
he was the thing slumped in the passenger seat, broken, dead. You want me to come along? She asked Tess without knowing why. No, Tess replied in a hollow voice. Go in the house. I'll take care of everything from here. Although she wanted to stay, Isabel was drawn back into the house. She did not even stop to look at Alex for a final few seconds as Tess pulled away. She heard the engine start. As crying, she made her way back to the Valenti home. I didn't want to see this. I didn't want to live through this. The pain was unimaginable. She was back in Kyle's bedroom. Echoes of Tess and Alex resonated through her head. The fight played over in her thoughts, his final words, his final scream of pain. Isabel collapsed onto the floor at the spot when Alex had, where Alex had died, weeping uncontrollably. Why? The bedroom door slammed behind her, drawing Isabel's attention away from the empty spot on the floor. With tears in her eyes and streaming down her face, she looked at the closed door. There was no one there. Then she felt his presence in the room before she saw him. Still on the floor, she wiped the tears from her eyes and looked at the bed beside her. A small boy was sitting on the edge with his legs gently swinging back and forth. He was looking down at her, both sad for her and frightened of her at the same time. It's all my fault, he said in a hollow voice. Jim Valenti crept silently through his house, taking extra care not to wake up his son, who had crashed on the couch. He was used to the hush puttering around because Kyle used to sleep there regularly while Tess had been staying with them. Valenti cringed when he thought of his former house guest. He had taken the seemingly helpless girl into his home and let her live with him and his son as a part of their family. And all the while she was using one of their friends and ultimately wound up killing him. Valenti had always prided himself on his detective skills and still had not managed to get over the fact that he had lived with week, for weeks with a murderer under his own roof. Pushing the useless regrets out of his head, Valenti took a moment to observe his slumbering son. When Kyle was a child, Valenti used to make a practice at appearing into the boy's room. When he, could, when he would come home late from work to make sure his son was sleeping soundly. He especially made a habit of it after his wife, Michelle, had left them for parts unknown. Sitting for a moment on the patio bench, he remembered. Back to the time when music had filled the house. He and his former wife would take turns singing their son to sleep on the nights he had come home from work on time. He had forgotten how much he missed the music until recently. The memorial for Alex had been a powerful reminder. Kyle was tossing on the unmade couch and mumbling slightly. Valenti worried that his son might be having a bad dream because the way his face was scrunched as if in pain. He remembered back to a time when, as a child, Kyle always looked like a cherub lying under the covers, one of heaven's youngest angels. Valenti chuckled to himself as he thought, Kyle would love me to describe him that way in front of his friends. I'll have to remember to do that someday. Still in silence, Valenti finished up his morning rituals, planning for the long day ahead of him in which he had much to do. With writing a note to his son, he tried to explain what he was up to, but decided on a simple, gone out, be back later, because the full explanation was more than one sheet of paper of the notepad could manage to fit. Valenti left the note on the coffee table, taking one last look at his sleeping son. Then he threw on a light jacket and made his way out the front door, humming as he carefully closed the door behind him. The slight click of the lock was enough to rouse Kyle from his somewhat troubled sleep. Morning came for him much more slowly than it had in the past few days. Light was st streaming through the window, warming his face, brightening the darkness behind his eyes. The dreams had not gone away, but somehow they had seemed more manageable, more tolerable. For the first time in weeks, he felt somewhat rested. Peering through the slits in his eyes, he turned his head at the clock on the wall and saw that he'd actually gotten over five hours of uninterrupted sleep. It wasn't a full night, but it was far more than he had slept in a long time. With a small sense of relief, Kyle fully opened his eyes. Rolling off the couch and onto the floor, he did his usual quick of set, set of push-ups to get the blood flowing and rouse the body and the mind back into full consciousness. He hadn't done this morning ritual in several days since he was usually too tired to get out of bed, much less attempt any exercising. Today, however, was different. True, he was still somewhat groggy, but at least he felt rested. Reaching out to the coffee table, he picked up his father's short note and added yet another meaningless clue to the mystery of his dad's disappearing acts. Oh, well, he will tell me when he's ready, Kyle thought. Stretching, he stood and scratched his belly. Taking a deep breath, he felt more awake than he had in days, but still with some more residual sleep, filling his head. It was taking a while for him to clear his mind and become fully conscious, but at least he wasn't plagued with horrible images. He hoped that the feeling would last the rest of the day, or at least the morning. Moving to the bathroom, he splashed some cold water on his face to shock himself into consciousness. 
It seemed to work as his brain slowly came around. He took a long look up at himself in the mirror and was surprised to see he looked happy and far more awake than he actually felt. This is going to be a good day, he thought, as he prepared to start it off, totally unaware of the fact that Isabel was still in his mind. Chapter 10. Lying in what must have been the most comfortable bed on this or any planet, Max was reluctantly waking to the new day. He had heard a buzzing in his ears slowly breaking through his sleep, enough for him to think an alarm clock was going off. Realizing that he had set no alarm, Max assumed there was a fly circling his head. He swatted away whatever it was that stole him from his peaceful dreams. Unfortunately, once the buzzing stopped, he knew that he was too awake to, reckon, to recapture his lost sleep and would have to get out of bed soon. He took a few minutes for the rest of his body to catch up with his now partially aware mind, wondering what new challenges Jason would present today and how he would handle them. Liz had a great idea, he thought. Who could ask for better on-the-job training for fatherhood? Just as he was finally ready to pull himself out of bed, Max heard someone knocking. Max, are you up? Liz asked through the door of the guest room in which Max had spent the night. They had agreed that it would be best if they were sleeping in different rooms in case Jason got up before them. Things were stressful enough already that they didn't need to add anything else into the mix. Not that they would have been doing anything other than sleeping in the shared room, but Jason's young mind probably wouldn't have assumed that their intentions were entirely pure. And the jury was still out on what Liz's young friend would be keeping secret when his parents returned, if anything at all. Come in, he said, yawning. Liz opened the door. You're still in bed? It is Saturday, he reminded her, as if weekdays and weekends really mattered in the summertime. Pulling back the covers, he revealed he was dressed only in a t-shirt and boxers. How long have you been awake? Liz politely turned so he could have some privacy as he slipped into a pair of jeans. Long enough to have eaten my breakfast and gotten a shower. Liz Max immediately felt guilty for sleeping in. You should have woken me up. I just did, she said with a sly smile. Turning, she went back into the hall. Don't worry, you can have breakfast with Jason. Thanks, he called after her, dreading the idea of another meal spent in silence. Day two begins. Walking only a few steps down the hall, Liz brought herself to Jason's door. Pausing to take a deep breath, she braced herself for whatever response she was about to receive. Jason, time to get up, she said, knocking. Jason? Max joined her, brushing his hand through his hair to get it, to rid himself of bed head. Let's not start this again, he said under his breath. Turning the knob, he found that the door was unlocked. Jason, we're coming in. And they did. Jason, however, was not in the room. Max thought the unmade bed looked out of place in a still spotless room. In fact, it was the only thing that indicated a 12-year-old lived here, lived there. He must have gone downstairs already, Liz said, hopefully. Max feared otherwise, as he remembered the boy's miserable attitude from the night before, but he chose not to say anything for the moment. With a growing sense of dread, he started down the stairs behind Liz, silently willing her to move faster. They didn't find Jason in the kitchen either, and there was nothing around to indicate that he had made himself breakfast. The only dishes out were the ones that Liz had already cleaned and left in the drain board to dry. With growing concern, they searched the rest of the first floor from room to room and found nothing. Should we try back upstairs? Liz was trying to remain calm. He's not there, Max said, pulling on the shoes he had left in the foyer the night before. He's not in the house. It's a big ranch. Liz grabbed her own shoes. He's probably out somewhere on the grounds. I hope, Max added. We're probably just overreacting. Liz tried to put reason behind her positive spin. He's not a baby. He can get up and go out on his own in the morning without us sending out a search party. There was a long pause as Max tried to find a way to share her attitude, but failed miserably at it. As such, he chose not to say anything at all. He's run away, hasn't he? Liz finally accepted the suspicion she was trying to ignore. We'd better start looking. Max walked to the front door before he gets too far. Liz followed in a rush. The morning air was brisk, but Max could already tell that the day was going to be a little warmer than the rest of the week had been. It was beginning to look like their unseasonably cool summertime is coming to an end, probably not today, but soon. However, Max had far more important things on his mind than the weather. His first official act as a responsible adult, and he had lost the child. This did not bode well for his future parenting plans. Where should we start, he asked. Let's try the rear edge of the property, she suggested. We can systematically work our way back to the house from there. 
Since Liz was only slightly more familiar with the layout than Max, she led the way as they searched the grounds. Relying on her memories her visits from years past, Liz took them across the acres of field as they headed for the back section of the fence that surrounded the property. If Jason had decided to hide on the range, he was probably doing so far away from the house as he could. If that was true, Max hoped the search would be over in a matter of minutes. Did Jason ever mention any places he liked to go, like a secret fort or a clubhouse? Max thought back to his own childhood and the castle he had made out of cardboard boxes in the backyard. Funny how I never realized how appropriate it was for me to have a secret castle. Liz scanned her memory, going over past letters and emails. Not that I remember. He hardly ever wrote anything about the ranch. I always thought it was strange since he lived in an apartment in Roswell before moving to this huge place. I know I probably wouldn't have stopped talking about it if I'd had a place if I'd had a place with so much room to play when I was his age. Seems a little lonely, Max commented as they walked across the field. So big and empty. Did he ever mention any friends? Maybe he's over at someone's house. He never told me about anyone here, Liz said, but we have been out of touch for over a year, which is like an eternity at his age. He could have a ton of friends, or none at all. It sounds like his life is about as lonely as Michael's was growing up. This is as far as the land goes, Liz said, as they came to a fence made of wooden posts with some kind of wire strung between. It didn't appear to be a sturdy fence, but it looked to be strong enough to keep the sheep in. Max paused for a moment, wondering where the sheep had been. He hadn't seen any since their arrival, although he, Liz, and Jason had been in the house all afternoon yesterday. Off in the distance, he noticed a barn and assumed the sheep were kept safely inside. He remembered something about ranch hands and figured that they should be coming around shortly if they weren't on the premises already. They could potentially make searching for Jason a much more public event, which had its fair share of positive, positive as well as negative aspects. Liz looked out onto the adjoining property. A few horses were meandering around aimlessly. I don't see him anywhere. Should we start over there? Max pointed at the barn. It's as good a place as any, Liz said as they started off in that direction. The barn was set off to the back corner of the property and looked like it had been added much later than the rest of the building. Max found that to be odd, since the barn was usually the whole purpose that this type of property existed and was generally kept rather close to the house for obvious reasons. He couldn't help but suspect that the barn had been moved to its present location in recent years, considering that having sheep too near the house would probably be in conflict with maintaining its clean exterior. So they made their way across the field, Max's eyes tracked across the Lyles' property. There really wasn't much to see other than an open field, the main house, a rather large garage, and a small guest house which he assumed had been once a house for the ranch fans once back in the early days of the property. Max thought about the guest house and figured that would be their next place to search on the property. He didn't think Jason seemed the type of boy to hide out with the sheep in the barn, but in keeping with their plan to work from the back to the front, it was the first place they would have had to rule out. Actually, he assumed that Jason wasn't playing a game of hide and seek on the property at all. But before they could leave the grounds, they first would have to confirm that Jason wasn't on them. Wait a second, Max said, as Liz was about to open the big barn doors. Maybe we should look in the window first and see what's inside. I would hate to open those doors and let a flood of sheep loose. Good point. Liz let go of the handle. We should also check for those ranch hands. It's weird we haven't seen anyone yet. Max had to climb on top of the barrel to reach the window. Once he managed to get his balance and see inside, he was surprised to find absolutely nothing in the barn. It's empty, he reported back to Liz. No ranch hands? she asked. He hopped down from off the barrel. No ranch hands, no sheep, no anything. The place is deserted. Who owns a sheep ranch with no sheep? Liz asked the obvious question. Max pulled open the doors. Jason, are you in here? Stepping inside, their voices echoed in the emptiness. Jason, this isn't funny, Liz added as the words she spoke reverberated off the walls. He could be in the loft. Max pointed to a ladder along the back wall that led to the second floor of the barn. I'll go check, she said, and started heading to the ladder. I can go. Max offered. He climbed up on the barrel, she replied. Now it's my turn. We could both go, he said, when they reached the ladder. It doesn't take two people to look in an empty box, she said, as she started up the ladder. Stop being such a gentleman. It's starting to get a little sexist. Sorry, he said, as he watched her climb the ladder. Is there anything up there? He hollered to her. Nothing but a bunch of flies, she yelled back, working her way down. Flies. He turned the word over in his mind. That's it. You know where Jason is? She asked excitedly. Not exactly, Max replied, but I think I know how he got there. Chapter 11. He rang the doorbell once again. Kyle waited outside the Evans home, hoping that Isabel would answer. 
He had experienced this first night of uninterrupted sleep in the longest time, and it was all thanks to her generously spending the day with him yesterday, as well as a lar large part of the night. Sure, he still had some troublesome dreams, but they did not rose him from his precious slumber. He knew that he hadn't caught up with all the sleep that he had lost, but it was certainly a start. Tired of waiting, Kyle started to walk back to his car, not knowing what he would do with the rest of his day. He knew that Mr. and Mrs. Evans weren't home, but he hadn't expected Isabel to be out so early since she had stayed up late with him. Then again, maybe she's not up yet. Since he had come over to thank her in person, Kyle figured he should at least confirm that she was, in fact, not in the house. Making his way around the Evans residence, he decided to try what unofficially had become the primary way of entering homes for him and his friends. Peering into Isabel's window, he confirmed that she indeed was still asleep. Hope no one thinks I'm a peeping Tom. Kyle checked around to make sure he wasn't being watched as he was watching Isabel. She looked so peaceful that he decided not to disturb her since, she, since he was the reason she was sleeping late that morning. He was about to leave when the inherent detective traits he had received from his father and grandfather kicked in and he noticed several things wrong with what he was seeing. Isabel was still wearing the same clothes from yesterday, which he did not think to be all that odd considering that she might have been too tired to change when she got home last night. But as he looked further into the room, he also noticed that she must have been too tired to turn off her desk lamp as well. Then there were other bothersome clues that something was wrong, like the fact that she was lying on top of the covers on what Kyle knew had been an unexceptionally, or excuse me, an exceptionally chilly summer night not to mention that her body was sitting up and twisted in what looked to be a very uncomfortable angle for sleeping. Concerned, Kyle pushed open the window and stepped inside. Isabel, he whispered so she, he could wake her gently. That didn't work. Isabel, he tried more loudly. Isabel, moving in, he progressed to shaking her, first gently, then roughly. Isabel, wake up, come on, you're scaring me. Her head rolled to the side, but her eyes did not open. Kyle laid Isabel down in a more comfortable pose and frantic frantically searched the room for clues as to why she wouldn't wake up, but found nothing. What's going on, he thought, in the mirror of reasons why she would not respond to him. Alien disease, body snatchers, are we under attack? Do these things hibernate? Grabbing a hand mirror off her dresser, he tried a trick that he had learned when taking care of his grandfather. Holding the mirror above her lips, he held his breath as he waited for proof of hers. The mirror fogged as Isabel exhaled, confirming that she was alive. With that done, he had no idea what to do next. Liz. Seeing Isabel's cordless phone lying on the nightstand, he picked it up and started to dial Liz's home number. But then he remembered that she was out of town and she had taken Max with her. He considered trying her cell phone, but with Artisia an hour away, he was hoping for some more immediate help since he wasn't sure that now was a good time to be alone. Michael, but he didn't know that phone number. Continuing his frenzied search through the room, he tried to find Isabel's phone book, but it wasn't by the phone and he had no idea where she could have put it, if she had even had one at all. He gave up on that search, figuring that she probably knew Michael's number by heart and didn't have it written anywhere. With his father pulling yet another disappearing act and going out before Kyle had even gotten up, there was no reason of him even trying his own home for help. Suddenly, his small group of friends seemed to be considerably smaller. Isabel, get up, he tried again, yelling and shaking her. He checked your pulse and found it a little slow but nothing to add to his already growing concern. Her skin felt cool to the touch, indicating that she, had pro she probably didn't have a fever. Isabel, nothing. As he wondered what to do, Kyle thought he heard a noise coming from another part of the house. He was struck with the sudden fear that whatever or whoever had done this to Isabel could still be in the house. 
However, he resisted the temptation to call Sheriff Hansen for help, knowing that if he had brought the police to the Evans home, he could be asking for more trouble than he was currently facing. Besides, he wasn't even sure if he had heard a noise or if it was his imagination acting up. Searching the room again, Kyle grabbed a tennis racket as it was the only weapon he could find. Peeking out Isabel's door, he began his search of the house, silently cursing himself for not going to get some kind of help first. Kyle confirmed that the hallway was empty before stepping out and crossing into Max's room. Luckily, the door was open so he could tell there didn't seem to be any surprises in there waiting for him. The room appeared to be empty, but he searched it anyways, since it was the most likely place someone would be hiding if they were looking for something alien related. Exchanging Isabel's tennis racket for Max's baseball bat, he tried the closet, but happily found it to be empty. Keeping the bat in his hands, he moved on to the rest of the house. Making his way through Mr. and Mrs. Evans' bedroom, he continued to find nothing out of the ordinary. Glad to have the weapon for protection, he took his search to the rest of the house, going from room to room, checking the doors and windows as he went. The doors were all locked, but most of the windows were not. However, all of them were closed except for the one Kyle had come through. Ending his search back in Isabel's room, Kyle let some of the tension released from his body, content to believe he, was the, he had only been hearing things. He put the bat down in the corner, making sure it was easily acceptable, accessible in case he needed it later. Michael, I'll be right back, he promised Isabel's prone form with help. Back out the window, Kyle hopped into his car and pointed it in the direction of Michael's apartment. He hated to leave Isabel alone as she was, but he had no choice. If he had been thinking clearly, he would have tried to call Maria. Even if she wasn't home, her mother probably could have given him Michael's number, but Kyle wasn't thinking clearly. He was thinking of the myriad of things that could have put Isabel in her comatose state. Zooming through the streets of Roswell, he was afraid that he might get pulled over by the police. True, he could probably talk any of the deputies out of giving him a ticket since he had grown up around most of them, but he didn't want to have to waste the time being lectured since they all still thought of him as a little kid. He silently prayed to Buddha to keep fortune on his side as he headed for Michael's place with his tires screeching at every high-speed turn. Deep within the recesses of Kyle's mind, Isabel sat in an exact re recreation of his bedroom. She was no longer alone. A boy sat beside her who appeared to be around six years old and seemed to be Kyle. Isabel had known Kyle for years, although they had not been close friends until recent events had thrown them together. She remembered how he looked the first time she had seen him at school. The small boy who sat beside her on Kyle's bed seemed slightly younger than the Kyle she had met on the playground that fateful day when her friends and she had actually noticed the boys on the junior league football team for the first time. There was no doubt in her mind that this boy was one and the same. He sat there silently, swinging his feet back and forth. The bed actually squeaked si si slightly with each swing of the leg, impressing Isabel by the sheer realism of the dream. Other than that, the room was deathly silent. He had not said a word since his cryptic acceptance of the blame. It's all my fault. Isabel had lost track of time but she knew that she must have been in this dream walk longer than in any other she had ever experienced. This concerned her on two levels. First, she worried about her own body since her subconscious had never got, been gone for so long. And second, she worried about what she could be doing to Kyle's already fragile mind. I was just supposed to look around, she reminded herself. Are you sure you don't wanna talk? She asked the boy yet again. He shook his head. Kyle, she said, deciding to take the chance and use his name. He looked up at her, confirming her suspicions, but remained silent. I understand that you might not want to say anything to me right now, she said gently, 
but if that's the case, I'm going to have to leave. Young Kyle Valenti had a momentary flash of fright across his face, but it was quickly replaced by a firm look of resolve. He seemed determined about something, but it remained a secret known only to him. His feet continued to kick against the bed in a familiar rhythm. Tap, 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 tap. I'm sorry, she said, but I'm afraid if I stay any longer, I might hurt you. Hoping to calm the child, Isabel realized that she was only explaining her motivation for leaving to a shatter, shadow projected by Kyle's mind, but this was uncharted territory for her. She was even more concerned that she was doing permanent damage with each passing min minute she spent in Kyle's subconscious. Reaching back into herself, Isabel consciously willed herself, her sub subconscious to return to her body. Closing her eyes, she prepared for the journey. But when she reopened them, instead of finding herself back in her room, she was still in Kyle's bedroom or more specifically in the dream image of Kyle's bedroom. She tried once again, closing her eyes, welcoming the sensations that she had grown so familiar with in her many past dream walks. She reached out for the floating feeling usually associated with the freedom of traveling outside of her own body and sought the safety and reconnection of her return. However, she felt none of the, those things as her mind remained locked inside of Kyle's. Why can't I leave? She asked the boy, trying not to panic for both of his sake and her own. Kyle could wake up soon, she thought, incorrectly assuming that she was trapped in a nightmare when in reality, it had already become a waking dream. I don't want you to go. He finally spoke with childlike innocence, typical for his age. But I have to, she calmly pleaded. I've been here too long, it's not safe. I could be hurting you. He just stared resolutely. Please, Kyle, she begged with a little more agnation creeping up within her. I promise I'll come back tomorrow night if you wanna talk and every night after that until you feel better. No, he said firmly. I don't want you to go, ever. Okay, chapter 12. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where are we going? Liz called to Max as she tried to keep up with him. We're following a hunch. Max stalked his way over the ranch land he and Liz had just traveled, heading back in the direction of the house. Circling around the front, he veered to the right and followed the driveway of the garage. Pulling on each of the two large garage doors, he found that they were both locked. Do you know where the keys are? He started to circle the outbuilding, looking for another entranceway. I think I saw a set in the kitchen. Liz started, started to walk back to the house. Never mind, he said as he turned the corner and found that a side door had been left wide open, presumably for their benefit. Liz turned back and followed him into the garage. Inside, they found out that it was large enough to fit four cars and was just as spotless as the house had been. There was currently only one actual car in it, as well as the space for the big SUV on Jackie and Mr. Lyles had left in. The rest of the garage was taken up by two all-terrain vehicles that looked exactly like the ones in the photo Max had picked up in Jason's room the previous night. Making his way around the car and to the bikes, he immediately noticed that there was enough room between them and the wall to assume that the third bike had been taking up the space until recently. I heard a buzzing this morning. Max bent to see a faint tire track on the concrete floor. I thought it was a fly in my bedroom, but it must have been the sound of Jason's ATV drowned out by my closed window. I didn't hear anything, Liz said, wishing she didn't have to contradict him. You were probably in the shower, he replied. She thought that over and suspected he'd be right. Are you sure there, there were three bikes? Jason has a photo of him and his parents in the bikes. Max searched for more clues to confirm his suspicions. He said they own them. Besides, everything in this house is so precisely organized. Don't you think it's a little odd that there's a big empty space between the wall and the bikes? Like there's a room for a third? Nice detective work, Sherlock. Liz was genuinely impressed. A wooden key rack sat on the wall. It was carved in the shape of a dirt bike and had three empty pegs sticking out from it. He took all the keys. Why would they keep the keys right next to the bikes? Liz wondered out loud. It would make them pretty easy to steal if someone got into the garage. 
I think that's the point. Max looked at the two remaining ATVs and couldn't help but figure out which one belonged to Mr. Lyles. The bikes were almost identical with their red and black painted designs, but the one he assumed was the property of the head of the house looked like it had never been ridden. It was amazingly clean for something that was built to get dirty. Although Jason made sure the bikes won't get stolen. He checked the remaining bikes and confirmed the two missing sets of keys weren't in their ignition. Well, that really shouldn't be a problem, Liz gave him a sly smile. Wordlessly, Max placed a hand on each of the two remaining bikes, concentrating on the engines that powered them. A soft glow emanated from his palms to the starters. When, within moments, the engines were buzzing, a louder version of the same sound Max had heard only a short time ago from his comfortable bed. Why did I ever get up, he wondered. Max grabbed a helmet and a set of safety pads that were neatly laid out on a nearby shelf, handed them to Liz. Turning back to the shelf, he grabbed his own equipment and strapped it on, taking a minute to get the bindings done up correctly. I think I can give you a quick lesson on these things, Max, he said as he laced up the knee pads. They can be a little dangerous. But Liz was already geared up and seated atop her bike, revving the engine, looking ready to go. She couldn't help but notice the expression of surprise Max had on his face. I did date Kyle Valenti for a summer. What do you think his idea of a fun day out would entail? In the same way he knew that Michael had a tendency to shock Maria, he hoped Liz would never stop surprising him. Let's go. Max aimed his right hand at a button on the wall. The electronic garage door opened in front of them. They pulled the dirt bikes out of the garage and rode at the loop of the driveway out to the street. Stopping, they looked in either direction to see if there was oncoming, any oncoming traffic or possible clues to tell them in which direction Jason had traveled. If we go left, that takes us right into town, Max not, not noted skeptically. I doubt he'd go, he'd go there on an ATV, Liz agreed with his unspoken thought. There was another properly direct, property directly across the street from them. Max crossed out that direction as a possibility. To the right, they saw there were only a few more ranches to pass before the road opened up into the desert. He must have gone that way. Max, look at this. Liz called his attention to the side of the road. Together, they coasted their bikes over. Tracks, he said, confirming what, what she had been pointing out to him. The set of bike tracks had come off the Lyles' property, continued down the dirt path along the side of the road. Now that we know for sure that he left the grounds, Liz said, maybe we should call the police. I don't know, Max's mind was working on another idea as he stared at the tracks. They were fairly deep in the soft ground. They seemed like they would be rather easy to follow, at least for a while. Something's obviously wrong with Jason. If we involve the police, he may never trust us enough to tell us the truth. Max tried to remember a time when he had considered the police to be the first people he could turn to in an emergency. When he was a child, Officer Friendly would often visit his school to give lectures on safety and what to do when strangers approached. He had always felt better knowing that the officer with the calming voice was keeping the town safe. Back then, the police were the good guys, and as such, he had always felt protected under their watchful eyes, even when he'd realized that Officer Friendly's real name was Valenti, and actually had been the father of one of his classmates. He still did feel reasonably safe around the police for the most part, but things were more complicated now. Lately, the police were the last people he could go to for help. Max knew he couldn't trust anyone currently in law enforcement, not because they were out to get him, but because it was their responsibility to report anything out of the ordinary. And the situations that Max usually found himself in were certainly out of the ordinary. At least I know I can trust Officer Friendly again. But here they were dealing with an ordinary case of a missing child. He worried that his lack of trust in the police could easily put Jason's life in jeopardy. However, he had a nagging feeling that if he and Liz followed the trail and found him on their own, it could ultimately help out with whatever his real problem turned out to be. I don't know, Liz said, sharing his concerns on both sides. I'm really worried about Jason. Me too, Max replied still eyeing the set of tracks left in the sand by the tires of Jason's ATV. How about we call the police if we don't find him in an hour? Liz was hesitant to agree. I think he wants to be found, Max added. Why do you say that? He would have used the road otherwise, Max replied. He left the tracks in the dirt for us to follow. Aren't you just the detective this morning? She was impressed by the way his mind was working. But if he wanted us to follow him, why did he take the keys to the bikes? Max thought back to the night before when he had been forced to use his powers to pick the lock to Jason's room, because he's a smart kid. Rubbing their engines, they started down the side of the road, careful to keep an eye on the tracks as well as the traffic as they headed out of Artesia. The road wasn't very well traveled and the wind was light, so they didn't have any problem following the trail they had stayed fairly intact for them. 
Max graciously allowed Liz to lead the way since she appeared to be more confident on the ATV. It really has been years since I rode one of the, these things, he thought. Once they passed the last ranch, the tracks were veered off into the desert as Max had suspected they would. Again, the lack of wind over the open land worked in their favor as the tracks remained easy to follow. Liz sh slowed her bike to a stop and uh, surveyed the land in front of them. It was totally flat for quite a while before little, hit, little hills popped off, up off in the distance. I don't see anything. Me neither, Max agreed, pulling up beside her. But he did have a bit of a head start on us. We're, we were ride out for a while, then turn back. Okay, she said, rolling the bikes forward. But we'll have to take it slowly. I'm just a novice at, the thing, at this thing. You're already doing better than me, he said. I noticed. She gave him a wicked grin and picked up the speed on her bike. As they continued, the trail stayed relatively fresh for them, with only a few spots where it was obscured by underbrush or the light wind had simply blown sections of it away. Jason had been riding in pretty much a straight line, which was further proof to Max the boy wanted to be found. Both Max and Liz continued at a safe pace to make sure they didn't lose the trail or hurt themselves. After about 15 minutes of no riding, they reached the area dotted with small hills that were somewhat similar to sand dunes. The change in their path forced them to be even more careful of where they were where they were riding. Max had moved into the lead position, but the amount of care he was taking as he rode didn't prepare him when he reached the crest of a hill and lost the trail, as well as the ground beneath him. The bike jumped into the air as Max looked down to see a gaping hole directly under his rear tires. He threw his hand back and a familiar green forest field spread beneath him as he and the bike came crashing down upon it. Tumbling from the bike, he managed to keep his concentration focused on the forest field so it did not drop him down the dark hole. Max, Liz yelled a couple seconds later as she too was airborne. Sliding his body to the side, he watched as Liz crashed down onto the shield where he had just been lying. He was impressed by how she managed a seemingly impossible task of staying on her bike, although she looked more than a little rattled by the jarring experience. Are you okay? His voice was trembling with concern for her. She nodded her head deliberately. The forest field continued to hold, protecting them from the dark cavern that lay directly beneath them. Hurry up, he said, pushing Liz and her bike off the shield. I don't know how long this will hold. He knew firsthand that his force fields are good for repelling bullets and evil alien beams, but he wasn't sure how long it could support the combined weight of Liz, him, and the pair of ATVs. As soon as Liz and her bike were on solid ground, he used his free hand to pull his bike and himself off the green force field. Breathing a sigh of relief, he allowed the power of the force field to return to his body. Now only a big hole with some variety looking wooden beams lying across it sat in front of them. What is that doing here? Max asked, still catching his breath. Must be an old mine, Liz replied, looking at the big hole. They're all over the desert. You'd think there's a sign, there'd be a sign or something, he said, looking for some type of warning, but finding nothing. You'd think, she agreed. They were standing on what looked very much like a crater, with dirt rising around it on all sides. However, instead of finding a sloping depression in the ground, a dark crevice opened up beneath them. The chasm was about 20 feet in diameter and had several rows of rather loose looking beams stretched across the top with several gaps of varying winds beneath them. At roughly the same point where Max and Liz had come crashing down on the ATV, several of the beams were broken through, revealing nothing but darkness below. To Max, calling it a mine seemed wrong somehow. A mine invoked pictures of a large opening cut in the side of a mountain with wooden beams forming an arch that marked the entryway, maybe a set of tracks leading inside. He had seen that type of mine often in the old movies and cartoons. What he was looking at now was not the type of place like that Wiley Coyote would have dreamed up or Indiana Jones would have explored. This was quite literally a hole in the ground. Looking back down the hill, Max confirmed that the tracks they were following did indeed lead in the direction. Jason definitely came this way, he thought, but was too afraid to suggest what he was thinking to Liz. He didn't want to know if his suspicions were true, and more importantly, he didn't want her to know. Hello, is someone up there? A familiar young voice yelled from deep inside the mine shaft. Help! Max was relieved at hearing the voice that had confirmed Jason was still alive. Jason, is that you? Liz screamed back on the edge of panic. Liz, help! Jason was past the edge. Hold on, Max called back while searched for the area for anything he could use to make a ladder or some kind of rope. We'll get you out. How far is it to the bottom? I don't know, Jason yelled back. I'm not on the bottom. What do you mean? Liz asked, straining to see into the darkness beneath her. Where are you? I'm on some kind of beam, he replied. My bike fell to the bottom. It's down really, really far. Max could hear Jason's voice trembling as it echoed up the walls of the shaft. 
We'll get you out of there, Max promised. Hurry, Jason replied. I think the beam is going to fall. Chapter 13. Opening her tired eyes, the first thing Marie saw was the beautiful painting still sitting directly in front of her. The second thing she saw was the light coming in through the window. And naturally, the third thing she saw was the clock. Michael, it's morning, she screamed, waking her sleeping boyfriend. How could you let me fall asleep? My mom is going to kill me. Then she's going to kill you. And then she's going to kill the both of us again, just for the heck of it. What? He slowly came around to her shrill yells, not having heard a word of what she had just said. Morning, she slowly summed it up for him in a clear and concise manner. My mom, me, you, dead. Well, we can't do anything about it now, he replied. He wanted to turn over and go back to sleep, but he couldn't because he was sitting up on the couch. His neck ached because of the awkward angle he had slept at. Maria calmed herself, knowing he, that he was right. Feeling morning breath overtaking her mouth, Maria reached in her purse for some mints. I swear, one of these days, I'm going to give that woman a heart attack. Since you're here, Michael tested the waters. How about making some breakfast? She glared at him in response, punching on a mint. Kidding, he replied defensively and got off the couch, moving into the kitchen. You cooked last night. It's my turn this morning. What would you like? And keep in mind, I only have eggs. Michael Garen, she was shocked by the question. Offering to make me breakfast? The world must be coming to an end. Have you been taken over by an alien? Oh, wait. Never mind. It's a limited time offer only. He had no patience for her sarcasm first thing in the morning. He had no patience for anything first thing in the morning or most points in the day. I would love breakfast. She leaned in to kiss him but stopped short before making contact. Ew, have a minute. She handed him an extra breath freshener from the pack in her hand. The romantic mood ended. She released him from her embrace and sat back on the couch admiring the wonderful painting as he went to the refrigerator to find out what was in there that he could use to make breakfast. You know, we could probably have a showing of your art at one of those galleries along Main Street, she suggested with mounting excitement, or we could do it at the crash town. It, could be, it would be a great gimmick. The cook slash artist, the local papers love that human interest stuff. And Mr. Parker would probably love the free advertising for the place. We could put all your work on display. All what work? He was afraid where this was going. It's one painting. Sure, now, she replied, moving into the kitchen with him, but I think you've got this artist in you struggling to emerge. All you need is my inspiration. Think of me as your muse. Not interested. You haven't even thought about it, she whined. Artists can make a lot of money. Once they're dead, he said, reminding her of the odds of successful living artists. Like I said, I'm not interested. What happened to the promise you made last night to stop trying to change me? I was emotionally touched by the painting at the time, she explained. The moment passed. So do you think you're more into oils or acrylics? I'm more into being left. Michael didn't have the chance to continue his thought because someone frantically started banging on his door. Marie started to open her mouth to respond, but Michael quickly covered it with his hand. The look of anxiety on his face begged her to remain calm, remain silent, and she gladly agreed. His biggest fear was that one day the wild pounding on his door would be the FBI, or worse. It was actually a fear that he had encountered in the past. It was not in a hurry to repeat. Michael, it's Kyle. Let me in, quick. Michael and Maria let out heavy sighs of relief as he removed his hand from her face. Don't ever bang on my door like that, Michael said as he opened the door to find an out of breath Kyle. Isabel's in trouble, was all he could say. After finally catching his breath, following the sprint from his car, Kyle quickly detailed the situation of his finding Isabel in her cosmetose state. Breathics forgotten, the three of them were out the door as Kyle returned to his convertible while Michael and Maria went to follow him back to the Evans home in her mother's Jetta. Unaware of the fact that Isabel's trapped in his mind, Kyle led his friends back to her unconscious body, re-entering the house by way of her window. He stood over her bed while Michael studied her prone form, not really knowing what to do. Regretfully, this was not the first time they found themselves in a situation where they didn't have a clue how to proceed. You found her like this? Michael asked anxiously. Well, she was kind of slumped over. Kyle explained, but I just straightened her out a little. Sitting beside her, Michael placed his hand on Isabel's forehead. She doesn't feel warm. Her face isn't flushed. He took her by the wrist and felt for a pulse. It seemed fine to him, neither noticeably fast nor slow. Her chest was rising and falling steadily. Was she sick yesterday? He asked. No, not at all, Kyle quickly replied. She was fine. Did you see anyone strange hanging around? Michael pressed on. Following you. No one. 
Kyle answered. No one at all. And she spent the entire day with you. Well, she did disappear for a few minutes to run an errand, but she wasn't gone long at all. Nothing seemed wrong when she got back either. Having come in through the window, neither of them noticed the yearbook on the floor, hiding slightly under the other side of the bed. I can't get Liz or Max on their cell phones. Maria came back into the room from the hall, carrying her own cell phone, also oblivious to the clue hiding out of her eyesight. They must be out of the service area, but I left messages. I also called the number Liz gave me for her friend's place. They have to check at least one of those phones eventually. Did she give you the address? Kyle asked, relieved now that he had someone to help him with the crazy situation. I could go get them. Our teach is only about an hour away. I don't know the address. Maria read her fingers on the cell phone to hit a pre-programmed number, but I could ask her mom. No parents, Michael stopped her. The more people who know about this, the worse things can get. Maria sat on the bed opposite Michael and performed her own check for life size just to confirm everything for herself. We should think about maybe taking her to the hospital. And then what? Michael's usual hostility intensified the more frustrated he became by the lack of action. Let them run tests? Maybe draw some blood? Good idea, Maria. Even though she was used to his antagonistic attitude, Maria was still hurt by Michael's words, but she tried enough to show it, knowing he was already under a tremendous amount of stress. Well, the next person we left, we let in on our little secret had better be a doctor, preferably a world-renowned surgeon who specializes in bizarre cases. I'm tired of relying on guessing games and Native American rituals. Maria, you're a genius, Michael said, giving a rare compliment as he got off of the bed and moved to the window. I'll be right back. Kyle, can I borrow your car? Why not take the Jetta? Maria offered up her mom's car instead, since it was parked right next to Kyle's. Take the old beat of Jetta over a Mustang convertible? Michael was already straddling the window sill. So. Are you out of your mind? Hey, remember who's to blame for the Jetta being so beat up? She replied. Kyle? Michael was still waiting for an answer. Sure, Kyle said, fishing in his pocket. Here are the keys. Don't need them. Michael was gone before Kyle could even reply. I guess that's what it means to be second in command, Maria said, regarding her boyfriend's quick exit. And to think, I always dreamed of falling in love with a mysterious man of action. Kyle took Michael's place sitting on the bed and gently stroked Isabel's hair. I don't get it. Nothing alien happened at all yesterday. What could have occurred between my place and here? In Roswell, it could have been anything, Maria replied. I mean, really, take your pick. We got aliens, alien hunters, feds, skins, and even a not-so-crazy self-made millionaire who owns the UFO Center. The silence that fell over the room was broken by the doorbell. Kyle and Maria froze. Don't look at me, Maria said. I'm not going to get it. Do you think Michael forgot something? Kyle innocently asked, wondering whether he should answer. He's not really a doorbell kind of guy, Maria said, or a front door kind of guy for that matter. Wait here, Kyle replied. I'll see who it is. Making his way through the house, Kyle wondered who could be at the door, since all the members of their inner circle were currently accounted for except for his dad. In vain, he hoped it could be someone soliciting charity donations, selling cleaning supplies door to door, or anyone else who would not ask for an explanation for what he was doing answering the Evanson's door. He tried to come up with excuses as he walked through the house, but realized he didn't have a clue what to say. The bell rang once again as Kyle unlocked the door and turned the knob. Swinging the door open, Kyle initially thought he had left out since it wasn't someone he immediately recognized. Please be selling something, he thought once again. The slow realization crossed his mind as he thought he recognized the face as being slightly familiar. The man standing at the threshold to the Evans home was Hispanic and appeared to be only a few years older than Kyle. He was dressed casually in a polo shirt and khakis, but the image that popped briefly into Kyle's conscious mind had the man dressed in a suit. That was the image that did it for Kyle. He knew it was one of Mr. Evans' employees. What's his name? Kyle thought to himself. Jesse something. Chapter 14. I'm going to call for help, Liz said, pulling her cell phone out of her pocket. Wait a minute. Max's mind was racing as dozens of scenarios played out in his head, although none of them ended well. Maybe there's something we can do first. Max, you heard him. She ignored the phone for a moment. The beam is loose. He could fall any minute. We have to get someone out here. He knew she was right, but he also knew that if she made the call, their situation would immediately spiral out of control. Liz, whoever we call is going to alert the media. Think about it. A kid trapped in a mine shaft? They'll eat the, that, this kind of thing up. We're talking national news. Our face will be plastered everywhere, and I'm not just worried about Jason's parents finding out. I stayed the weekend. Liz stared at him blankly. Then Max stopped for a moment to truly understand what he had just said. I'm putting my secret ahead of Jason, he realized. I'm risking his life to protect my own. Without thinking about it further, Max reversed his decision. 
make the call. Okay, Liz said, but you've got to get out of here. I'll handle everything on my own. No, Max replied, I'm not going to leave him. Knowing she was wasting time, Liz picked up the phone and switched it on, dialing 911 without noticing the numbers weren't beeping as she pressed them. When she held the phone to her ear, the realization struck her with horror. My cell's not working. Here, try mine, Max pulled out and handed it to her. Pressing the on button, she quickly discovered that it was also out of the service area. What are we gonna do? She asked, handing his phone to him and placing her own back in her pocket without realizing that both of them had irretrievably, irretrievable messages waiting. Into the hole, she yelled, hold on, Jason, I'm going to get help. Max will stay here with you. Jason suddenly screamed. What's wrong? Liz yelled. The beam is slipping, he hollered back. Jason, Liz and Max yelled in unison. I'm okay, he hollered back a little more calmly. It stopped. How far down are you? Max was readying a plan of his own, removing his pads to give himself more maneuverability, but keeping the helmet on. I don't know, Jason replied. Not far. I'm going down to get him, Max calmly said to Liz as he circled the hole. He found a point along the edge where there was enough space between the two of the beams for him to easily fit his body. How? Liz was concerned about the risk involved, but even more concerned for Jason's safety. We don't have any rope. I can create handholds in the wall. Max peered into the hole so she couldn't see the fear in his eyes. It will be just like climbing a ladder. It's too dangerous. It's our only choice, he insisted. Liz felt helpless. Be careful, she gave him a kiss for luck. Aren't I always? He shot her a comforting smile. Turning, he started down the mine shaft. Max carefully kicked his feet into the wall of the mine shaft. Holding for a moment, he allowed the dirt to form around his shoes as he used his alien powers to manipulate the molecular structure of the soil and harden it into a strong foothold. Then he lowered his hands and did the same, curling his fingers into the wall of the shaft so the handhold would give him something to grasp onto. Slowly and methodically, he repeated the procedure as he made his way down the side of the mine shaft. As he went, he made sure to keep the handholds and footholds close together since Jason would need to use them on the way up and he was slightly shorter than Max. The sun was rising higher in the sky as more and more light filled into the mine shaft. Max couldn't quite make out Jason's form below him, but his eyes were beginning to adjust to the darkness. As he continued the descent, he thought he could see the outline of a body in the shadows below. Jason, I need you to talk to me so I know when I'm getting close. You're almost here, Jason replied, looking up at him. I can make you out against the light coming from the opening. You look kind of like Spider-Man clinging onto the wall there. Max beamed at the reference, considering that high praise from Jason. There were many times in the past when he'd secretly compare his alien powers with those of comic book superheroes. In fact, when he was younger, before he realized the truth, he thought that maybe he was a superhero himself when his abilities started to present themselves. He had even drawn up designs for his own costume. He supposed that, technically speaking, the concept of an alien sent to Earth where he exhibits unusual powers did kind of fall into the superhero archetype. I'll have you out, out here in a few minutes, Max said reassuringly. You'll be home in no time. No, came Jason's reply. Max paused where he was clinging to the wall. What was that? I don't want to go home, Jason replied, recalling the clear visible path that had led them to Jason, Max had to degree, disagree. I don't think that's true. I wrecked my bike, Jason replied, his hollow voice sounding much closer. George is going to kill me. Max continued his climb and could, see, could now see Jason sitting on a collection of weak looking cross beams. He was pleased to see his young charge had the foresight to be wearing his helmet and pads when he had sneaked off on his bike. I'm sure he'll just be happy that you're okay, he said. You don't know him. Max examined the layout, trying to figure out the best way to get him off the beam. Jason was about four feet away from him, but in Max's current position, there was only air between him and the boy. Let's talk about this once we're out of this hole. Jason didn't reply. 
How did you manage to get caught on the beam? There used to be a bunch more going all the way across to where you are now, Jason calmed, calmly explained. My bike landed on them. I could tell they weren't strong enough to hold it, so I jumped off. The bike went crashing down only a few minutes later. It sounds really far to the bottom. Eyeing the remaining beams that sagged under Jason's considerably lightweight body, Max could easily tell that they would not support, support the boy much longer. And it was also clear that they could not handle his added weight either. He would need Jason to slide over to the wall. The only problem was that Max had come down nowhere near the point where the beams met the wall. I'm going to have to come around to that side. Max freed his right hand from the wall to point to the direction he was about to move. Stay exactly where you are until I get there. Okay, Jason replied. Instead of placing his hand back in the handhold he had taken it from, Max stretched as far as he could to the right to get another grip into the wall. He had followed that with his right foot. Then he placed his left hand and left foot in the holes he had just vacated. The beam was now only about five or six feet away. Removing his right hand from the wall again, Max repeated his move, but instead of creating a small handhold, the dirt wall started to fade away in large chunks. Throwing his weight back to the left, Max regained his balance, but the wall continued to crumble. Focusing his power through his hands, he tried to will the wall back into place, but he could not stop the natural displacement of dirt. Both Max and Jason followed the dirt avalanche with their eyes wide as it slid closer to the point where the wooden beams just met the wall. Jason, hold on, Max yelled as he went back into the position he had been in before he started moving to the side. Jason laid on his stomach and tightly hugged the beam he was on. The dirt wall deteriorated at an alarming rate. The end of the beam began to slide down the wall. Max aimed his hand at a point several inches beneath the beam, readying himself to use his force field. He hoped he wouldn't have to deploy it in front of Jason, but he knew that exposing his powers to the boy was far more preferable to, wa to watching him fall to his death. One of the wood beams behind Jason slipped out of the wall and started a long fall to the bottom. Max could hear it hit the ground and agreed that Jason was right when he had said it had been a considerable drop. Fortunately, the wall stopped crumbling and the beam Jason was on came to a rest only after sliding a few inches. Max stayed where he was afraid to move either left or right. He knew that the part of the wall he was on was stable. He had seen to it as he climbed down by using his powers to manipulate the molecular, molecular structure of the wall, but he was afraid to touch the loose dirt to the side of him for fear it would, fall, it would all falling away again. Okay. We're going to have to go to plan B. Max reached his arm to check the distance between him and Jason. I'm not going to like this, am I? The boy, the boy asked. You'll be fine. Max paused to convince himself that plan B was in fact a viable option. He realized that there was really no other choice. I'm going to need you to jump to me. Are you crazy? Max tried to keep his voice calm, although his entire body was trembling as he considered what they were about to do. It's only a couple of feet. I've got a good hold on the wall. It will be okay. He wasn't entirely telling the truth because his body was beginning to tire from the strenuous activity, but he knew that he would have to keep going for Jason's sake as well as his own. Jason looked down beneath them. Although Max knew the boy couldn't see the bottom, they were both aware of the minimum distance the drop had to be based on the length of time it had taken for the beam to crash to the ground. When Jason looked back up, Max could see even more fear in his eyes. I can't do it, Jason said, still hugging the beam and shaking his head vigorously. As if to help Max convince him, the beam slid an another inch. You've got to, Max said in a forced, calm voice. Trust me. Jason looked up at the teen he had hardly even met. Max could only meet his gaze, trying to be both forceful and calming at the same time. He hoped that his face showed the look of someone Jason could trust. Okay, Jason resolved, I'll do it. Max let out a sigh of relief. Good, now I need you to stand up slowly. Jason did that as he was told, balancing himself on the unstable beam. 
All right, Max said, continuing to use the ultra calm voice, calming voice. When you jump to me, you're going to have to use the wood to push yourself off. That means you're going to be adding extra pressure, which means the beam is going to collapse. James, Jason completed the thought with his voice shaking. So you're going to have to move quickly. Max concurred, no hesitation, no turning back. I can do it, Jason said firmly, as he obviously tried to convince himself to believe what he was saying. Although Max could still hear the hesitation, he knew that Jason was ready. Max removed his right hand and foot from the wall and leaned back to the left so he could form a pocket for Jason to jump into. I want you to throw yourself into my body. I'll grab you as soon as you hit. Can't I just reach for your hand, Jason asked. But Max had considered that option and was afraid that even if Jason did manage to clasp onto the small target with his skinny hand, his skinny hand would slip right out of Max's grip. This will work fine. Jason looked unsure, but determined. On three, Max said, preparing his body to take the impact when Jason hit. One, two, three. Jason launched himself off the beam. The beam tore away from the wall. The boy's body slammed into both Max and the wall at the same time. Max threw his right arm around Jason and turned his own body into the wall. The beam crashed down many, many feet below. Jason was cradled in Max's body and pressed up against the wall. They were both breathing heavily and holding tightly onto the wall. As the realization struck them that they had been successful in what they had just done, both boys started laughing uncontrollably. Max, Jason, is everything all right? Liz screamed from above. Obviously, she had heard the crash. We're fine, Max hollered up to her as the laughing subsided. He looked to Jason to confirm that he was fine and found him to be shaking and breathing heavily, but surprisingly unscathed. Time to make like Spider-Man, Max said with a look of relief. The hard part is over. Let's get out of here. Still cradling himself in Max's body, Jason turned around to face the wall. Max instructed him on how to use the handholds and footholds that he had left behind on the way down, hoping that Jason just assumed they were a part of the original shaft design. Either way, he did not question their escape route as they slowly made their ascent to freedom 30 feet above. I don't know whether to hug, hug you or hurt you, Liz said with relief as she saw Jason's head pop out of the hole. I think he's been punished enough, Max said, pulling himself up onto solid ground, still shaking. As soon as Jason had found his footing and moved away from the hole, Liz wrapped him up in the biggest hug she could muster. Jason flinched as she squeezed, causing her to let go immediately. Are you okay? Her concern came back as she saw him nursing his shoulder. Yes, he said quickly. Let me see. She leaned to him, attempting to pull the neck of his shirt aside, but he struggled against her. Jason, hold still. She held tightly onto him and finally managed to tug the shirt away from his shoulders, revealing a huge bruise. Suddenly, all the pieces fell into place for Max. We should get you to a doctor, Liz said. It's okay, Jason replied, really, but you could have you could have a serious injury from the fall, Liz said. That bruise doesn't look good. Jason said nothing in response. That mark isn't from the fall, is it? Max asked almost rhetorically, since he has suspected that he knew the answer. Jason sat on the ground, but remained silent. You had it last night, didn't you? Max gently prodded. Liz looked at Max questioningly as they both sat on either side of their young friend. She had no idea what he was talking about. You pulled away when I touched your shoulder last night too, Max recalled. I thought it was because you just didn't like to be touched, but I had hurt you when I grabbed the bruise. Is that true? Liz asked, obviously concerned. What happened? Was it George? Max carefully continued the questioning, choosing the most likely suspect. Jason nodded, refusing to look at either of them. Liz looked to Max, afraid of this of, that the situation was out of their league, but too concerned to let her fears get in the way of helping her friend. How long has this been going on? Again, no answer came. 
Jason say something, Liz pleaded. She was obviously upset by this surprise revelation. Please, I wanna help you. Max placed his hand on her shoulder as if to say that's enough. Liz looked into her boyfriend's eyes. He could tell she was hurt and confused. Max knew that she was probably blaming herself for not realizing what was happening sooner. He gave her shoulder a supportive squeeze. It's okay if you don't wanna talk about it right now, Max said, and it doesn't matter how long it's been going on. It won't happen anymore and we'll make sure of that. Liz added to his sense of conviction, I promise you. Now, do you have a family doctor we can take you to? Max asked, I wanna make sure you didn't hurt yourself in the fall. Then he silently added to himself and to make sure Mr. Lyles hasn't done any permanent damage. Jason nodded his head. Max got up and gave a hand to both Liz and Jason to help them off the ground. Hopping onto the bike, he made sure there was room for Jason to fit behind him. Once the boy was safely on, Max turned back to him. Keys? Fishing in his pocket, Jason pulled out two sets of keys. How did you? Max flashed him a cryptic smile and took the keys out of Jason's hand, tossing one set to Liz and starting his own bike with the other. Grabbing the keys, Liz got on her bike and started it up. As the trio started back through the desert, neither Max nor Liz gave any thought to the cell phones in their pockets that were still out of the service area and sorting some very important voice messages. Chapter 15. Hello, Kyle said, still holding onto the door, making sure the visitor could not see inside. Not that there was anything to see, but just in case something odd happened. This was a valid concern considering the group's history. They never knew when something strange could be going on behind them. Jesse was naturally surprised to see the stranger instead of Isabel opening the door, but he recovered quickly. Hi, I'm looking for Philip Evans. I work with him. Yeah, Kyle stalled while trying to come up with a good cover story. I know. You're Jesse, right? Yes, Jesse replied. I'm Kyle. He held out a hand to the inter to interloper while keeping the other hand firmly on the door. I'm one of Isabel and Max's friends. How are you? Good, Jesse replied, trying discreetly to peek through the partially open door. Is Philip home? Actually, no, Kyle responded abruptly, faced with at least one question he could easily answer. He and Mrs. Evans are down in Santa Fe for the day. Jesse feigned surprise. That's right, I forgot. They went to that arts festival. Right, Kyle ho hoped this piece of information would send the visitor on his way. I can take a message for when they get back. Is there something you needed? I just wanted to talk about a case we're working on. Jesse created his own cover story as he grew more concerned that Isabel had not come to the door yet to rescue him from the situation. You couldn't have called, Kyle asked, suddenly suspicious. Between being the son of a former sheriff and all the alien conspiracy stuff going on in recent history, Kyle's senses were honed to picking up on any kind of questionable behavior. I was in the neighborhood. Jesse replied, growing suspicious himself that no one with the name Evans had come to see who was at the door yet. Otter, Otter still since Isabel was expecting him. Since I'm here, I was wondering if I could just pop in and say hi to Isabel and Max. Max isn't here, Kyle replied, grasping for some excuse, and Isabel is a little under the weather. Jesse was instantly concerned, remembering that she had canceled on him the previous evening to look after a friend she had said was really sick. Unaware of the fact that he was speaking to the sick friend, he tried not to appear too worried, especially since they were only supposed to be passing acquaintances. I hope it's nothing serious. Not really, Kyle flat out lied. Would, he, would it be okay if I stopped in to say hi? Jesse moved toward the door. Kyle, however, stayed firmly planted in place. Actually, she's resting right now. She said she didn't want to be disturbed. By anyone? Jesse left the charade slip for a brief moment. Confused that she hadn't called him to stop him from coming over or alerted this kid to the fact that he might be stopping by. Yeah, Kyle said, growing even more suspicious. If you don't mind, I should get back inside in case she wakes up and needs something. Are you sure it's not serious? Jesse asked. His anxiety is beginning to take over and push their whole hidden relationship out in the open. Positive, Kyle said, trying not to stretch the lie too far. We called the family doctor and he just said to let her get some rest. Nothing to worry about. Okay, Jesse felt some minor relief. When she wakes up, please let her know I was here to say hi. Will do. Kyle closed the door before anything else could be said in their odd little interaction. He would have, have to make sure to fill Isabel in on his lie when she woke up so that no one would question her about it later. That's the problem with lies. Even the simple ones require tremendous attention to detail. Of course, that's all assuming that Isabel will wake up. Don't even think like that. Who was at the door? Maria asked as Kyle came back into the bedroom. She was sitting beside Isabel, holding her hand, rubbing it in small circles with her thumb. 
Someone from Mr. Evans' firm, Powell replied. Nothing important. Any change? No, Maria replied hopelessly. And I still haven't been able to get in touch with Max or Liz. Meanwhile, Michael's still off God knows where. Have you tried your dad? He's pulled another one of his disappearing acts, Kyle said, wondering once again where his father was spending his time lately. I've hardly seen him at all this week. What is with the parents in this town? Maria asked, frustrated. They're never around when you need them. Kyle nodded in agreement. What do we do now? She asked. Wait, he replied, as his mind spun with possible plans of action, but nothing came. How I long for the day when waiting isn't our only plan of action, of inaction. Kyle bristled from Maria's comment. He knew she meant nothing by it, but it still bothered him that he didn't know what to do. He couldn't think clearly. His mind was full of confusing, unclear images. Not now, he thought. This is not the time for a flash. His fingers tapped against his leg for the first time that morning. This time, however, Kyle felt them pressing into his flesh and actually took notice of the action. Tap, 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 tap. I think I'm going to meditate for a while. He left the room, hoping to calm his mind before things got out of hand. They certainly didn't need two crises to deal with. Do you really think this is the right time to voluntarily make yourself unconscious? Maria asked, following him into the living room. You know, considering... I won't be unconscious, he explained, hoping he didn't need sound condescending to the unenlightened. Meditation allows me to perform a conscious exploration of my mind. It will give me the opportunity to organize my thoughts and purge any images that do not belong. Kyle often felt that people had a tendency to listen to him and explain his beliefs as if they were humoring him because what he was saying was a joke somehow, especially his father. But he thought Maria of all people wouldn't understand. Would you like to join me? Thanks, but I like my cluttered mind the way it is, she said. Although at the same time, she took a few drops of her calming cedar oil. Kyle took a seat on the floor, placing his body in the lotus position. With his legs crossed and folded over each other, he then closed his eyes and began his breathing exercises, trying to establish a sense of inner peace. Great, Michael's going to come back to find two unconscious bodies, Maria said to herself as she went back to Isabel's room. Walking up to the bed to check on her friend, Maria's foot kicked something on the floor. Bending to retrieve the item, she found a copy of their yearbook lying there, closed. Maria picked it up, flipping through the pages, settling on the familiar photo of herself. Her face scrunched up as she once again regretted the awful picture. What was I thinking, she thought. Talk about a bad hair day. Shutting the book so she no longer had to look at the offending picture, she placed it on Isabel's desk on top of another book that had been lying out. With nothing else to do, Maria sat by Isabel's side once again, holding her friend's hand, wondering what could be going on. Isabel was banging against the door, frantically, frantically trying to break out of the room as to freedom from its confines would free her from Kyle's mind. Through the banging, she thought she had heard something on the other side. Putting her ear to the door, she listened and was able to make out faint voices arguing. She assumed that it was just echoes of Tess and Alex. The memory of his murder sent chills through her. She almost yelled out for help before realizing how pointless that would have been since no one was really outside the door. Truth be told, she wasn't actually inside the room either and it concerned her that her body was across town without a conscious mind inside. Will I ever be able to get back? The voices just dis disappeared and Isabel gave up on the door entirely. Okay, Kyle, she turned back to the little boy. Let's be proactive. You want me to stay here? Tell me why. The six-year-old version of Kyle was throwing a baseball into the air and catching it as it came back down. I don't know, he said as the ball went up into the air. Are you afraid of something? She sat beside him on the bed, taking random guesses to try to figure out the problem. The ball continued up and down. Is it Tess? She carefully pushed. Are you afraid of Tess? The ball continued its repetitive journey. Is it someone else? She tried a new track, with frustration creeping into her voice. Did someone hurt you? Kyle missed the ball as it came down. It rolled across the floor and under his dresser. The boy looked like he was about to tear up. I'll get it, Isabel offered. Don't cry. It's just under the big boys don't cry, he said firmly. Having Hearing a response, she ignored the ball and focused on the boy. And you're a big boy? Yes, he said. But sometimes big boys do cry, she said, if something really hurts. No. Why do you say that? Big boys don't cry. Okay, fine. Isabel gave up on trying to change his mind, bent to the floor to get the ball. Reaching under the dresser, she slid her arm from left to right, but couldn't find it. The piece of furniture was small enough that she was able to touch the back wall, but she found nothing. The ball was gone, but then again, it was never really there in the first place. She thought about telling him that the ball was missing, but figured he probably knew, since this was his world and she was just a guest in it. Giving up, she resumed her place beside Ky little Kyle on the bed. So are we going to all sit here forever, or do you have something else in mind? Wordlessly, the boy finally got off the bed. T Intrigued, she got up and went for the door. So are you the ghost of Christmas past, present, or future? Little Kyle ignored her comment as they walked through the Valenti home and right into the police station. 
This time, however, it was empty. Making their way through a maze of twisting co co corridors that didn't exist in the real Roswell police station, Isabel followed the child right up to the sheriff's door. He stopped there waiting for her. Assuming that it was her job to open the door, Isabel stepped up to turn the knob. It's locked, she said after meeting resistance. Listening at the door, she had expected to hear someone crying again, but she heard nothing. What is it, Kyle? What are you trying to tell me? You're not supposed to go in there, he replied. Then why are we here? She was trying to figure out the puzzle, but the trip was not a great example of linear thought. What am I supposed to see? The world shifted around her as the fluorescent melted into the bright light of the sun and the walls and floor fell away. They were back in the desert at the same spot where Isabel had first entered into Kyle's nightmare. Little Kyle dropped to the ground and started digging. The vulture or buzzard or whatever it was circled overhead while it either chased or was being chased by another one of its kind. What are you looking for, Isabel asked, bending over the youngster and peering into the hole. Treasure was his cryptic response. What kind of treasure? She knelt beside him. Buried treasure. Should have seen that one coming. Here, let me help. She dug into the ground with her hands, thinking of the three-day-old manicure on her fingers as she clawed into the dirt with the pleasant knowledge that at least she was doing no real harm to her physical body. She figured they would have to find whatever it was they were looking for much faster if she joined in. How far do we have to dig until we find what we're looking for, came yet another cryptic reply. She could feel that something new had come into the dream. Ignoring the digging for a moment, she saw an object glowing in the distance, assuming that little Kyle would be okay on his own in his own dream world. Isabel stood up and started walking to the strange object. As she got closer, Isabel could see that it was some kind of huge iridescent orb hovering about three feet above the ground. Translucent colors swirled around the surface of the orb, and as Isabel approached, she could make out the shadow of an image inside. She was so focused on the orb that she did not notice little Kyle had disappeared behind her and the birds were no longer in the sky above. Stepping up to the strange sight, Isabel held her hand up to block the sun as she peered inside, saw the teenage version of Kyle that she was familiar with, sitting in the center of the globe with his back to her. He was floating in what he, she recognized as the lotus position. Kyle, she yelled, banging on the orb, wondering if this new version of her friend was there to answer some of her questions. If only she could get through to him inside the sphere. But he did not turn to her. Assuming that he simply could not hear her while she was inside the orb, Isabel went around to face him. Kyle, she banged on the surface of the orb again while standing right while standing right in front of him. He closed his eyes, his eyes did not open. The orb began to radiate a bright light, replacing that of the now missing sun. Isabel stepped back as the orb expanded in size. For the first time, she noticed that parts of the desert image were disappearing, being replaced by blackness. Pieces of sky and earth had been fallen away, leaving nothingness behind as the place re reorganized itself. This is not so good, she thought as she bang thought, began banging on the orb once again. Energy flew from the orb, knocking her to the ground. A section of dirt disappeared beneath her hands as she nearly fell into the nothingness left in its place. Kyle, she threw herself against the orb, fearing what would happen if she got trapped in the void that was enveloping the dream world. Kyle, she kicked at the expanding globe. The darkness spread in pieces around her as Kyle was trying to organize his thoughts and remove the harmful imagery without realizing that he could be removing Isabel from existence. She had to take several steps to the left to keep him falling into the void as she saw the swirling colors of the sphere begin to fade. The surface of the orb began to clear and she could see Kyle much more easily now, but his eyes were still close to her. Kyle, from within his meditative state, Kyle could hear a voice calling out to him. It was familiar to him using the techniques he had been self-taught. Kyle methodically tried to clear his mind, removing the offending images piece by piece as he reached out to the voice. More of the confusion fell away as he concentrated on the voice. Kyle, open your eyes, she screamed, knowing she had little time to act because the blackness was taking over her. Isabel held out her hand to focus her concentration. She had no reason to believe that her alien powers would work in his, his dream world, in this dream world, but she was out of options. Kyle heard Isabel that time. She was reaching out to him, calling for him. He tried to do whatever he could to answer back, her back. Taking strength from her powerful fear, Isabel shot her hands out. Screaming Kyle's name, she forced the orb to burst in an explosion of light. I could really picture uh, Liz and Max on those ATVs. I'm like, oh, I would have loved to see that on screen. Yeah. What I like about this book is that we didn't get very much of what happened with Alex. We just heard little parts of it through the story. They brushed it. We get more details. You see exactly what happened to Kyle's mind, which is kind of, it's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Trippy. Yeah, I want to hug you. Like we didn't know that he like was going emotionally in emotional turmoil over everything that really happened. We don't get any of that really on the show at all, do we? Mm -mm. Well, yeah, they're gonna get we're gonna get deeper into his past too. 
something that's really haunting him in this whole situation manifests that. So we'll get a little is, bit more is, is for that too. Leaving? Yeah, we get we get that. That little boy. I thought so. Yeah. Before we do quarantine, watch season three, episode one. Okay. That's when it happens. Okay. Thank you. Why they put it there? Don't me. 